Hello, I'm David uh, and I'm one of the lecturers in the Maths Learning Centre at the University of Adelaide and this is a seminar on writing and using a cheat sheet. Before I get started I should be really clear that a cheat sheet, in inverted commas, is a page of handwritten notes that your course rules explicitly say you are allowed to take into your exam. So I'm not condoning cheating, it's just that here in South Australia uh, that's what um, students call that page of notes that you're allowed to take into your exam. They call it a cheat sheet. In some other countries they call it a help sheet or a crib sheet, but we call it a cheat sheet here. So I'm not condoning cheating, I'm just talking about cheat sheets. Okay, so this is the structure of the seminar. I'm going to talk about the usefulness of a cheat sheet. I'm going to talk about the process of writing a cheat sheet. I'm going to talk about how to make a good cheat sheet. And I'm going to talk about how to use your cheat sheet when you're actually in the exam. So before I start, I should tell you the story of our research into cheat sheets. So once upon a time, a statistics lecturer asked us to help the students to use their cheat sheets better. She's introduced cheat sheets in her exam, uh, and she discovered that the students weren't really doing any better or really weren't studying any differently. So she asked us to give us some advice to the students about using cheat sheets. So we began to prepare our seminar and in order to prepare we talked to some people and we looked up some stuff on the internet to see what we could find. When we talked to the various staff across the uni about using cheat sheets they all had an opinion and most of them had a very strong opinion for or against cheat sheets. When we talked to students about cheat sheets and their experience of using them in high school they told us that um, it helped them to study but when they got to the exam they didn't actually use it and they mainly referred to their experience of using cheat sheets in year 12 maths exams. When we had a look on the internet there was quite a bit of stuff but it was either on actually how to cheat so for example how to roll your cheat sheet up into the inside of your pencil so that no one can see you've got it or how to cram the most stuff onto it so for example how to use a photocopier to reduce handwritten pages down to fit eight of them on the same page um, and that's not particularly constructive and then we had a look at the uh, research literature in educational research um, and most of it's either just anecdotals or they're just telling stories of how their students um, experienced it which we already have from the staff and the students here at Uni of Adelaide um, or it's not about maths exams, it's about history, or it's about philosophy, or something else. And it's inconclusive at best. Um, the cheat sheets seem to help some people and not others, and contradictory at worst. So sometimes it seems to say something, and sometimes it seems to say others. So that was really basically left us with a lot of questions about cheat sheets, and we surveyed the students to find out more about what their experience of cheat sheets were. So these are our survey results. When we asked the students how they use their cheat sheets, they told us that they use them for formulas and lists and procedures and definitions. So the sorts of things that you can write down in a clear way um, and need to refer to every so often in the exam, they use them for that. Um, they said that they'd put worked examples on them and passed exam questions. And they said they use them for inspiration. So when they got stuck, they just looked at their cheat sheet, hoping that it might help them to, to think of something to do. And it wasn't always something that they put on the cheat sheet for the reason um, that they used it for. They just looked at it and it reminded them of something else. We asked them how they made their cheat sheets and most of them made them as a way to organize their thoughts, which is useful, but a few people found it as a distraction from their normal way of studying, uh, which is not as useful. We asked them how useful they found their cheat sheet and most people said it was very useful um, because it had all the formulas that they needed and a couple of people didn't say very useful but what they said was moderately useful and the reason they said it was moderately useful was because they didn't use it all of the time. They expected to use it every single second of the exam and they didn't which is probably an unreasonable expectation. And finally, um, we asked them how it affected their stress, because that's one of the main reasons that people advocate using cheat sheets. Most people said it reduced their stress because it stopped them worrying about having to remember stuff. Quite a few people said it reduced their stress because it helped them to study, it gave them something to focus on while they were studying. And a few people, about 10%, said it increased their stress because they were afraid of doing it wrong somehow, or putting the wrong information on or something like that. So your cheat sheet is 
possible to distract you from your study. And so that's the reason we have this seminar. We have this seminar to give you some really good advice about how to use your cheat sheet in a way that doesn't distract you from studying properly and doesn't distract you from doing your exam properly and so that it can decrease your stress rather than increase your stress. So that's the story. Now we'll actually get on to the proper seminar. So first we'll talk about the usefulness of a cheat sheet and we're going to start by talking about why your lecturer thinks it's useful. Your lecturer's main concerns are the understanding of the concepts in the course and your ability to solve problems. That's what your lecturer wants. And it's just a means to an end remembering the facts and formulas and procedures. They don't want you in its own right to remember things. That's not important to them. They only want you to remember things because it makes it easier for you to understand the concept and it makes it easier for you to solve problems. So what the lecturer thinks is this. If the cheat sheet can deal with the remembering, so everything you need to remember is on your cheat sheet so you don't have to remember it, then the exam can focus on understanding and problem solving. Okay, I'll let you think about that. That means that if a lecturer has allowed you to have a cheat sheet, in general they're not expecting you to remember things, but it also means that they won't ask you questions that only require memory. Okay, so if in the past you've done exams that say what's the definition of whatever you won't find those sorts of questions on an exam that has cheat sheets because you could just copy it off your cheat sheet right so it's not important to ask it so the moral is you really need to understand the concepts and the problem solving in your course and no cheat sheet can do that for you cheat sheet can only help you with your memory if you don't understand the concepts, the cheat sheet's not going to help. So that's the big moral you need to understand, regardless of whether you've got a cheat sheet or not. Now, this is why it's useful for you. It saves you lots of stress, and this is what we found in our survey. Look, it helps you to study. So lots of people said that when they have a cheat sheet, it gives them something to focus on for their study, so they can work their way through all the course notes and things and construct their cheat sheet and then they can use their cheat sheet as a way of telling them how they're doing in their exam practice. Okay, It gives you something to focus on while you're studying. So it's a really good tool to help you study. It's also a safety net. Exams are stressful experiences and it's well known that under stress um, logical thought is impeded and it's difficult to remember things under stress and so a cheat sheet means that you won't have to worry about that sort of mental block because you'll have the cheat sheet there to cope with the memory. So it's nice to have a safety net. And finally, you don't have to waste energy on memory. You don't have to spend hours trying to rote learn something. No, instead you can focus on understanding. Okay, so you have more energy to focus on your understanding, which of course is what the exam is actually about. You'll notice I'm going to make this point several times in this um, seminar. Okay, so that's why a cheat sheet can be useful. And the rest of the seminar is about giving you advice so that it can be the most useful it can possibly be. Next I'm going to talk about the process of writing a cheat sheet. Now this is the process I would use to write a cheat sheet. I think it's the best process um, and I'll explain why in a second. Um, you might have another process that you might prefer and that's fine but I think this process will produce the best outcomes for you. So I think this process will help you to understand the concepts which as I've stated before is what the exam is really about. So any process of writing a cheat sheet that doesn't help you understand the concepts is not really going to help you study for your exam. So that's one of the reasons. Another reason is that it's going to help you find the most useful things to put on your cheat sheet. The things that are useful for you. So the things that other, someone else wants to put on their cheat sheet is not necessarily as useful as the things that you put on yours for you. So this helps you find what's most useful for you. And finally, it helps you make your cheat sheet easy to use in your exam. Okay, so if you're going to use this process, it'll help you make a cheat sheet that you are able to use quickly and easily in your exam. So that's why I think this process is going to work for you. So it has two parts. There's the preparation part and there's the writing and editing part. 
So let's have a look at the preparation. There's three steps here. You need to sort the concepts you need to understand. You need to sort the facts and formulas and processes that you need to remember. And then you need to find out what you need help to remember. Because your cheat sheet is the things that you need help remembering. Okay, so we're going to start with the concepts because that's the most important thing because that's what the exam is about. So there's three points I want to make about sorting the concepts. The first thing you need to do is summarize your notes. You've got a textbook, you've got lecture notes, you've got various other notes um, and assignments and various other things. You've got a lot of information. You want to summarize the information in there, focusing particularly on the concepts. So write down whatever, what happened every week. Try and reorganize it. So the next step is that don't just write down what happened every week. Organize the ideas. Okay, when you're taught things, especially in maths, you are not always taught things in the order that it's easiest to remember things in. You're taught in the order that it's easier to learn things in, but you don't remember things in that order. So, for example, when you learn um, about counting, you just learn the names of the numbers first, and then you learn how to count by putting your finger on the objects as you say the numbers. And when you remember it back again, you remember both of those things at the same time. You don't remember them separately. And it's a similar thing when you're learning anything in maths. You need to reorganize it afterwards into an order that makes it easier to remember and to understand rather than the order that you learned it in because they're not always the same order. And a classic example is that you will often learn something right at the beginning of the course and you'll learn various things that are separated quite widely in time, but they build on the earlier stuff. So you don't really need to look at the earlier stuff, you just need to look at how it relates to the later stuff. So some advice on how to organize ideas. Make lists. Make lists of the major concepts. Make mind maps. This whole seminar is a mind map. I'll just zoom all the way out so you can see it all. That's a mind map with various arrows and connections about how things are related. And talk about the connections between things. Okay, So lots of things are connected to each other and you should try and explicitly make those connections. And the reason I say that is that the sensation of understanding in your brain is to do with the connections between your brain cells. If you force yourself to make those connections, you will feel that you understand better. Okay, so you need to make connections. Understanding is all about the connections between ideas. So any time that you see something, even if the teacher or the lecturer did not make those connections for you, you might be able to make even more connections by just writing them next to each other. So organize your ideas. In preference, you should organize your ideas by writing them down somewhere. And then the next thing you should do is ask yourself questions. The first question is, why is this here? So firstly, you should ask, why is this here in this course at all? Why are we learning derivatives at all? Why are we learning about matrices? Why are we learning about elementary matrices? Now, you might not be able to answer that question, but if you can have an answer to that, it does help you to understand. And the second version of why is this here is, why is this here in this place in the course? Why are we learning integration and then differentiation? Why are we learning about elementary, ma elementary matrices here, and then straight afterwards we're learning about um, inverses of matrices? Why are we learning this here in this order, because if you know why you're learning it in an order, you can have better chance of reorganizing it into an order that makes sense. And it also helps you to know how things are connected, which is the next question. How are things connected? How are they similar? How are they different? Can you use one to do the other? Is one before the other because you use it to prove that the other one is really true? And the final question is to ask yourself, what would happen if... So you're in various situations, you say, what would happen if the situation was different? Have I covered that different situation somewhere in the course? Or is it just something that's worth thinking about that won't come up again? And even if it doesn't come up again, if you can ask yourself what would happen if things are different, then you can know a little more about why it's the way it is in your course. Okay, so we've now had a really good way of sorting the concepts that we need to understand and the next step is to sort the facts and formulas and procedures that we need to remember and here's my advice about that the facts and formulas and procedures that you need to remember you get them from the assignments now you've already got a list of the facts and formulas and procedures when you were trying to understand your course but we're trying to figure out which ones we're supposed to remember so go to your assignments. You've been given tutorials and assignments and homework and all that sort of thing. You want to have a look at all of those things 
and go through them and write down everything that you're expected to remember, every time you're expected to remember it. So if you're expected to use the quotient rule for derivatives, make a table, write quotient rule, and put a tick mark every time you're expected to use it. Okay? And if you can make a list of how many times things are used, the ones that are the most used are obviously the ones that are most important to know. The ones that are only used a, a fraction of the time, they're less important to know, and probably therefore they're important to put in your cheat sheet because you can't remember them anyway. The ones that are really used really, really often, you should probably put some effort into remembering them even though you've got a cheat sheet because they seem to be really useful. So now that you know all the things that you're expected to remember and how often they're used, you can move on to try and figure out which ones you need help remembering. But one final point there, if you do this process, it will help you to remember the things that are used the most often. Because every time you see it, you'll reinforce that connection in your brain that helps you to get that information in and out. And final step, find out what you need help to remember. You need to try to remember. So, what you should do is now you've done all these lovely notes, you've got it all nicely organized, and you've got a nice list of the things that you ought to remember. You should put it all away and sit with a blank piece of paper and attempt to write down everything you can remember about your course. You can do it one topic at a time if you like, or you can do it the whole course. If you attempt to write down everything that you can remember and then go and check if you've missed anything, well, those things that you've missed are the things that you need help remembering. Everything else that you wrote down anyway, you don't need help remembering that. You can remember that perfectly fine without a cheat sheet. So now we finally have a list of the things that you need help remembering. And now we're going to write and edit our cheat sheet. So we're going to write the cheat sheet and we're going to put on the cheat sheet all of those things on that list that we couldn't remember on our own. Okay? Everything we couldn't remember on our own, we're going to put on the cheat sheet. And then we're going to practice using our cheat sheet in an exam situation, and I mean in an exam situation, that means that it's exactly like it is in an exam. You are going to put away all of your notes and only have your cheat sheet and whatever else information you need. Okay, You're going to have prepare exactly as you would for an exam. You're going to have your pencils and your calculator and all of that stuff. You're going to have blank paper. And you're going to do a practice exam. You're going to give yourself a time limit, and at the end of the time limit, you're just going to stop. You're going to do everything that you would do in an ordinary exam. You're going to put away your phone and the internet and everything else that might distract you because you wouldn't be allowed to have them in your exam. Okay? You're going to do it exactly as you would in an exam because practice makes permanent. If you practice doing an exam in the presence of the internet and your notes, that's the only way you're going to be able to do it. And when you get to the exam and you can't use those things, you're going to be stuffed because you don't know how to do your exam in those conditions. So practice doing it in the real conditions. And then you should edit your cheat sheet. Ask yourself, what was useful? So what things did you use on your cheat sheet? Um, was there anything missing? Was there new things that you couldn't remember or needed reminding of that you didn't have before? Those things should go on the cheat sheet. And can you make it easier to use? Did you find that you knew that a certain fact was on the cheat sheet, but when you looked at the cheat sheet, you couldn't find it? Maybe there's a better way of organizing the cheat sheet on the page so it's easier to find stuff. Did you find that you couldn't tell where one formula ended and the next begins? Maybe you should put some more space in. Okay, so you've now got a way of telling whether your cheat sheet's any good. And then you can go back and rewrite your cheat sheet and practice again and edit again and do this process as many times as you like. And the nice thing about this process is that it gives you an opportunity to practice exams. So you're just using your cheat sheet as an opportunity to help you do all the normal things you should do when studying for an exam, whether there's a cheat sheet or not. So that's my advice. The next stage is some advice on how to make your cheat sheet the best that you can. That stuff I said earlier, it's great advice. Um, but when I said, could I make my cheat sheet easier to read? I should give you some advice on how to make your cheat sheet easier to read in the first place. So I'm going to run through some various advice and I'm going to show you some examples of good and bad cheat sheets as well. So some good advice. It must be easy for you personally to find things on the cheat sheet and to know what it means when you've found the thing on the cheat sheet. 
That's the general idea. If it's not easy for you personally to find things on it, then there's no point having it because you can't find the information you need. And if it's not easy for you to tell what it means when you find the thing on the cheat sheet, well then it's not worth having that on there at all, is it, if it's not easy to understand what it means. So here's some advice on how to do that. Make your cheat sheet readable. Neat writing is good. Um, poor writing where you can't tell whether it's an S or an R or a T is bad and it's not going to help in an exam when you're stressed and therefore your, your thinking is not as clear. Make it as neat as you possibly can and writing a bit slow will mean it'll be easier for you to remember even without the cheat sheet. And if your writing's too small you won't be able to read it either. You don't want to spend waste precious minutes squinting at your cheat sheet trying to figure out um, what the words mean. You need to make the writing big enough to read. Now that means you might have to sacrifice some space um, and not put as much on it, but if you've already gone through the process of trying to remember so that you can tell what you need help remembering and what you don't need help remembering, you'll already have cut some things from your cheat sheet anyway, so it shouldn't be a problem to sacrifice some space to make your writing big enough to read. That said, you want to use your space wisely. There's only so much space you have and you want to use it as wisely as you can. So, three words are better than ten. You don't have to put in all the, the, the these and ands and conjunctions. You can write sentences shorter. And also a picture speaks a thousand words. Sometimes just a simple picture will tell you everything you need to know and you can remember from the picture what the information was. For example, with trigonometry, I instead of writing down what the values are for all of the common angles, I just draw two right angled triangles and that's enough for me to be able to remember it. Next thing is to organize things on the page and this makes them easier to find. So, put some space between things. At least put some lines on the page that separate it into pieces so that it's easier to find things. So put some space so you can tell where one bit of information ends and the next bit begins and try lining things up. If things are lined up when they're similar, um, it'll be easier to find them rather than it being some sort of random mess on the page. So if things are lined up in some way, connected in some way, um, it'll be easier to find information that is similar. And finally, use some signposts so it's easier to find things. The signposts will point to whatever it is you're looking for. So put headings on. So if there's a particular area of the course, you can put a heading that says trigonometry. Um, put arrows that go from one thing to another that connect them together. Put borders around things so that they're clumped together in a way that makes it easier to find. And color code stuff. Sometimes uh, you might want to have yellow for definitions and red for procedures and green for for something else or you might want to color code the different um, areas of the course anything that you can do so that when you look at the cheat sheet you can go straight to the bit you want rather than having to search it is a really good idea the next piece of advice is that you need to follow the rules as outlined in your official documents for how to use your cheat sheet because they might take it away if you don't follow the rules and you don't want to be in the situation where you put a lot of time and effort into studying using your cheat sheet and then they take it away. So check if you're allowed to have it handwritten or if you're allowed to have it typed. You do not want to go to a lot of effort typing your cheat sheet only to find that it had to be handwritten and it'll be taken away if it's got typing on it. My recommendation is you should probably handwrite it anyway, okay? Because there's usually no stipulation that it must be typed, um, and handwriting it means it's easier for you to remember if you wrote it with your actual own hand. But you need to check, okay? Most of them say it's A4 paper um, here in Australia, and you need to know that most lined paper is not actually A4 and is often slightly bigger than A4. So you will not be allowed to take in something if it's too big. So you should find real A4 paper that's definitely A4. And if you must have it lined, put the lines on yourself. Okay, you need to make sure your paper really is A4. If they want you to have one piece of paper or two pieces of paper, that really means it. It means that you can't put um, post-it notes on it. You can't stick 
bits of paper on top of that bit of paper. If you make a mistake and you want to you want to cover it up, then you need to use whiteout, um, or you need to just get a new piece of paper and write it again. Okay, you are not allowed to have multiple bits of paper attached to things if it says one piece of paper. Of course, this is dependent on how um, pernickety your exam invigilators are, but some of them have had a really bad day and just want to be nasty, so you don't want to give them an excuse to take it away. So one piece of paper means one piece of paper. And one or two sided, okay? So you want to check this for two reasons. One is if you're told that it's only allowed to be one sided and you write on both sides, then the whole thing's going to be taken away. Okay, so you want to make sure that if it's one sided, then you do it one sided. And if it's two sided, well, you want to be able to use both sides if you can. Okay? I would recommend on the two sides putting some completely different things on the two sides so that you don't have to flip back and forth between them all the time. Um, but you need to check if it's one or two sided because if you do it wrong they might take it away. Obviously if it's two sided and you've only used one they won't take it away. So you know maybe there's a lesson there. And finally some advice on what to put on your cheat sheet. You need to put the things on your cheat sheet that you need help remembering. Keeping in mind the good advice that I've given you so far about having enough space um, and colour coding and that sort of thing, the things that you need help remembering are the things that go on your cheat sheet. Anything else that you can remember without it, it's not worth putting it on. I mean, if there's enough space, sure, put something extra on, but don't cram more on if you can do that without a cheat sheet. So, processes, things that take several steps to solve that always use the same process, it's a really good idea to write that process down. For example, the process of finding the maximum of a function. And you can write, find the derivative, set it equal to zero, solve, write a conclusion. And you can write that process step one, two, three, four. I recommend not putting worked examples on your cheat sheet because what will happen is you'll waste time reading the worked example and trying to figure out what it means. And that's a waste of time, okay? You should have read plenty of worked examples in your study. Um, and if you can take those worked examples and distill them into a list, then A, it uses less space, and B, it uses less time because it's much quicker to read a list than it is to read an example. If you must put worked examples on, which, I, as I said, is not a good idea, then please don't just put the worked example on, but next to the worked example, mark the steps of the process and write what you're doing there. Okay, because if you have to read the worked example and figure out what you're doing, then it's it's a waste of time. Okay, worked examples are not good enough unless they are telling you the process. Put specific formulas so you can remember them exactly. So for example, for statistics, the formula for the T statistic for an unpaired T test, it's quite difficult to remember all the exact details. So write it down exactly and then you've got it there if you need it. Tables and lists are really good and they're, they are easy to read because they're organized very nice and lined up, like I said earlier. So definitions and information that's connected. So if you've got a list of information that's all connected, so for example, there's about seven things that you can use to tell if a matrix is invertible, um, and you can put them all in a list so that you know they all belong together. And every time you look at it, you'll have a chance of seeing something else that might be useful because it's nearby. And finally, reminders. For example, Sokotoa, uh, if you ever did trigonometry, that's sine opposite hypotenuse cos adjacent hypotenuse tan opposite adjacent. <clears throat> that sort of thing that only uses nine letters to convey a lot of information is a really good idea, like my triangles that I mentioned earlier. Things that just are just a quick reminder that will jog your memory so that the actual thing that takes a lot of space to write doesn't have to go on the cheat sheet, just the reminder does. But you need to know what the reminder means, of course, because if you don't know what it means, then it's a waste of space. So, that was all my advice of what to put on it. Now some examples. Um, these examples were taken from a second year statistics course here at the University of Adelaide. So this one um, is got some bad points because it's difficult to tell where one thing ends and the next begins. It's just blocks of writing. Um, and so what you'd prefer is to colour code it or put borders around things in some way. You can't tell where things are on this. Okay, so this one's not 
not that good. This one's a bit better, at least it's colour coded. In fact, I don't think it's colour coded. They've just used different colours to tell them where one bit ends and the next begins. I should point out how bad this actually is because this person hasn't actually followed any decent method of studying because you can see what they've done here. They've written down what's in every lecture. That says lecture 10, probability, etc. They've written down everything that's in each lecture which is really a waste of time because there's going to be a lot of things that are repeated um, and it's much better to organize things into topics rather than lectures. So this person hasn't really made their cheat sheet in any particular um, useful way. This next one is quite good actually. Um, they've given themselves a lot of space. They've got an area that's just got formulas so that when they're looking for the formula they can go straight there. They've put boxes around things so that they can find them easier. And they've left some space at the end to just put things just in case they, they need them right at the end just before the exam. They've left some extra space. That means they can put some extra things on. I'll just focus in on some of it. This is chi-square test. It's got a nice heading and it gives you some information. They've got steps step one, step two, step three. They've got a list of various information they need. It's very well organized and it's easy to get the information out. I would say, however, that they have put some examples on here with no particular description as to what's going on when they solve those examples. So that's not the best plan. They could at least have done some circles and arrows to say where the information's connected. Here's one that's quite good. They've made different sections. They've put it in columns so it's easy to organize. They've got pictures, they've got um, formulas, uh, and they've color coded different bits of the information. That's not too bad. Again, I quite like the previous one that had a whole section just for formulas, so it was easy to find the formulas quickly rather than having to search through the topics. Uh, I quite like that particular version. This one's you know, not too bad. It is printed and it has a lot of information on it, probably rather too much information. It's very dense. I would probably recommend having much bigger writing um, than this because it's a little too hard to read. And now here's the interesting bit. I know that this cheat sheet was actually photocopied from someone else's. So this person has actually taken someone else's cheat sheet into the exam with them. That's not a good plan. Someone else's cheat sheet is more or less useless. You know, and unless, of course, you know perfectly well how to study without a cheat sheet and the cheat sheet just distracts you, just taking someone else's as a security blanket is not such a bad idea. But if you must use someone else's, I recommend what this person does. This is the exact same cheat sheet, but this person has marked it up to make it easier to find things. They have color-coded bits. They've put boxes around things so it's easier to find. They've highlighted the bits that they think are the most important. And they've added extra information that they thought might be useful for them personally. So if you're going to use something else as a big basis for your cheat sheet to start with, for example, a, a formula sheet that might come in, the, in past exams before they had cheat sheets, make sure that you mark it up with some colors and some other helpful things that make it yours, make it personal. And finally, there's this one, which I think was probably written on the train on the way to the exam. Now, you may laugh at that, but it's not such a bad plan, right? If you're really good at exams without cheat sheets, you might as well just study the same way you always study because you have pretty good success with that in the past. And what this person has done is what it looks like on the day before the exam, on the day of the exam, they've just written down everything that they find hard to remember, and that's all they need. So... Just because a cheat sheet um, doesn't look like there's been a lot of time and effort into it, it doesn't mean it's a bad cheat sheet. This may be all the things that this person has trouble remembering and they feel like they're really confident with absolutely everything else in the course and they don't need anything else. So sometimes a cheat sheet can only have a little bit on it because the little bit on it is all you need. So that's my advice on how to make a good cheat sheet. Finally, using your cheat sheet. Okay, you're in the exam. So I've got three different time zones when you might be using your cheat sheet. First, before the exam. As I said in the preparation thing, you should practice exams with your cheat sheet. It's good to practice exams anyway, regardless of whether you're allowed to have a cheat sheet or not. Of course, if you've got an exam that doesn't allow cheat sheets, you should practice exams without cheat sheets, because you shouldn't practice doing something you can't do in the real exam. 
Um, if you do practice your exam with the cheat sheet, it will help you learn where things are on your cheat sheet so it's quicker to find them, and it will help you to improve your cheat sheet. And I've made all those points before, but it's really a big point, so I should make it again. You should practice exams with your cheat sheet before you have the exam. Lots of exams have reading time. You get into the exam and there's 10 minutes that you have to read, but you're not allowed to write on the exam paper. They'll usually give you scribble paper to write on. Um, and this is the time when you can use your cheat sheet to help you focus during reading time. A lot of people don't use reading time very effectively. They just sort of scan the exam or they start doing the questions and then they have to copy them into the exam paper later. That's probably a bit of a waste of time. What you can do is use your cheat sheet to help you focus on the really important information that you need to know. So. You should decide which part of your cheat sheet goes with each exam question. So, if you've got headings on your cheat sheet, it will help you. You can say, oh, this question's about trigonometry, this question's about statistics, this question's about hypothesis testing for proportions. And if you can figure out what each question is about, then you can go to your cheat sheet and go, oh, this part of the cheat sheet is about question one, this part of the cheat sheet is going to be useful for question three, this part of the cheat sheet is going to be useful for question four. And you can read over that and, and remind yourself of some of the useful information. And then what you should do is you should decide which facts and formulas and processes go with each part of the question. So you've got a question, question one, it's got A, B, C, D, E. You've decided that that whole question is about hypothesis testing for proportions, and so you find that bit of your cheat sheet. And then you go, all right, part A, that's asking me about that. Oh, that's this formula here. Part B, that's asking me about this. Oh, this process here is going to be useful. And you can work your way through each part of the question and figure out what that question requires you to know in order to do it. It helps you focus in reading time so that you've got sort of making plans of what to do. And finally, when they allow you to start writing, you should use it to help you finish your exam. There's going to be several times in an exam when you're going to get stuck, and this will help you to get over that hump and keep going. So what it'll do, it'll help you not to miss anything. So if there are some complex procedures that have, you know, 17 steps, if you've written all those steps on your cheat sheet, you won't miss anything. And it means you won't lose any marks because you'll have done all of the proper steps that they're looking for. Okay? Um, if they ask you to list some things, then if you've got a list on your cheat sheet, there you go. If they ask you to look at the assumptions for something, and you go, oh, there's five assumptions. All right, I've got a list on my cheat sheet. I'll go through each one in turn. Uh, and finally, it'll help you when you're stuck. So if you just get to this some point and you're going, right, I've gone as far as I can. I don't know what to do now. If you just look at your cheat sheet, it might give you some inspiration. And the main reason for it is this. If you had your cheat sheet with you and it was part of your study process and you used your study to create your cheat sheet and you used your cheat sheet to help you study, it was there all the time. It's like a souvenir from your study time. It would probably work just as well if you had a teddy bear that was there with you with your study and you took the teddy bear into the exam with you. If you looked at the teddy bear, you would be reminded of all the things that you did with your teddy bear, which is the studying. So your cheat sheet's the same. You'll be reminded of all the things that you did when you were doing your cheat sheet, which was your studying, and it will help you to figure out what to do next. And failing that, if you look at a part of the cheat sheet that's sort of roughly similar to what you're doing, you might see another bit that's related and go, oh, actually, that bit, I didn't think of that. And because it's next to it on the cheat sheet, you'll be reminded of something to do. So your cheat sheet can give you some inspiration for when you're stuck. It'll give you something to look at when you're trying to ponder what to do. And so that's using your cheat sheet. So one final thing, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the research. I did have a chat about our research, which was finding out how people use their cheat sheets and the sorts of things that help them um, succeed and the sort of advice they've been given that they thought was useful. And that's how we constructed this seminar. But here's some more research about whether the cheat sheet actually helps you to succeed in your exam. So very small up there on the Prezi. That's the reference that this came from. You can look it up. 1979, that's the year I was born. Um, it's very old research, but there is very little research in the success of cheat sheets. And this one's particularly poignant, so I want to tell you how it works. So what they did is they gave some students a test um, on some topic, and then they gave them something to learn, which was about that same topic. Okay, So they gave them a test before they learned it, just to see what they already knew. And then they gave them something to learn, and there were four groups of students that were told about their cheat sheet use before they were told to learn the stuff. So there was the group where they were given no cheat sheet and they weren't allowed to make a cheat sheet and they weren't definitely weren't allowed to have one in their next test. There was another group 
which were told to make a cheat sheet. Yep, m go ahead, make a cheat sheet, but you're not going to be allowed to use it in the test. We're going to take it off you just before the test. You can make it, but you're not allowed to use it. There was a group which were told to make a cheat sheet and were told, yep, you make a cheat sheet and you can take it into the test. That's perfectly fine. Um, we'll let you take a cheat sheet into the test. And then there was a final group which were told to make a cheat sheet and they were told that they were going to be allowed to take the cheat sheet into the test but unexpectedly just before the test the researchers took the cheat sheets away and they had to do it without their cheat sheet. So they were told they were going to be allowed to have one and they had to make one but then their cheat sheet was taken away and they had to do the exam without it. Hmm. And then they had this exam again and they compared the results of the before versus after to see if anyone did better. Okay, so the loser was, you can probably guess it, the people who made their cheat sheet in the knowledge that they were going to use it, but actually that knowledge was wrong and the cheat sheet was taken away. They did the worst. That was the only group that was actually significantly different from the others. The winner was the people who made the cheat sheet in the full knowledge that they weren't going to be allowed to use it. So they made the cheat sheet knowing that they weren't going to be allowed to use it in the exam, but they just used it to help them focus during their study. Those students did the best on that exam. And you can take from that what you will. Thanks for listening and good luck in whatever exam that you're going to use your cheat sheet for.